Well, good morning. I, I had thought that uh, this morning, I'd like to go, go on a walk with you, go on a walk to downtown Baltimore City. We're, we're not going in that direction. Uh, my wife, Vicki, and I um, live in uh, a condominium in downtown Baltimore. We live in uh, Spinnaker Bay. And if you were to come out of our front door and make a right, uh, you'd be walking north on President Street. Go north on President Street for about half a mile. You come to the intersection of President and Fayette. Turn uh, right on Fayette, and then you make a quick left, and you'd be on Front Street. Walk about three blocks on Front Street, and you come to the intersection of Front and Low. Um, which, and, and there you're going to find that old factory. It's um, abandoned. There's nothing going on in there. And its windows look like they've been used for target practice. It didn't always look like this, of course. Uh, 150 years ago, this was a very fashionable part of the city. This is where the Front Street Theater stood. The Front Street Theater was one of the most elegant theaters in old Baltimore. Seating capacity was 250 or 2,500. And it was a location for plays, for concerts, for social gatherings, even for some, uh, some political events. The building did not have a happy ending. On December 22nd, 1895, there was a capacity crowd there to hear an opera. There was a puncture in a gas line, and the crowd smelled gas and became uneasy. And then somebody shut off the gas line, the main gas line, which turned out all the lights inside the building on a December night, and the whole building plunged into darkness, and the crowd panicked. And then a fire started, and the crowd stampeded, and in the smoke and the flames, 23 people died. The building was badly damaged. It was never repaired. It was condemned, torn down, and that factory was built in its place. And then after years, the factory was abandoned. And that's what's there today. This is one of my favorite places in Baltimore, just to go up and hang around. Good morning. Thank you for being here with us today. I consider it an absolute privilege to be standing here in front of you. I pray that the Lord's name will be glorified all that is said from this platform today. I should like to begin by reading with you from the book of 2 Chronicles in chapter 34. In 2 Chronicles chapter 34, we read of a strange account that occurs during the reign of Josiah. Now, Josiah was the best king Judah ever had. He became king at age 8 and at age 16 began to seek in earnest to understand the Lord and to restore the worship of the Lord to its place in, in the kingdom. Among the things he did was to repair and restore the temple. And while that was going on, something very unexpected happened. Second Chronicles chapter 34, starting with verse 14. Now when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So Shaphan carried the book to the king, bringing the king word, saying, All that was committed to your servants they are doing. And they have gathered the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it 
into the hands of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Abdon the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah the servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me. And for those who are left in Israel and Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to, to do all according to, to do according to all that is written in this book. Last July, our brother Andy Dunkerton was in town and delivered two messages in consecutive weeks. It was his first message, which was entitled, A Word of Encouragement for Ambassadors for Christ, that Andy spoke of a man I had never heard of, but whose actions so long ago played no small part in the establishment of what we now call Forge Road Bible Chapel. The man's name was Alfred Loazzo. He was born in September of 1909 in Towson. At the age of 19, he graduated from the University of Maryland with a degree in business administration. Ten years later, in 1939, married Elsa Lang. Together, during their 61 years of marriage, they raised six children, and they had several grandchildren, including Carol Loazzo Johnson and Claire Loazzo Nolan, two friends of ours. He was, for many years, an elder at Lock Hill Bible Chapel. He was one of the founders of the Baltimore School of the Bible. In 1943, Mr. Loazzo donated his two lots that he owned on Goodview Road so that a new ministry could have a home. That ministry was called the Hillendale Sunday School, which aimed to share the gospel with the children of the neighborhood. Over the years, Hillendale Sunday School became Hillendale Bible Chapel. After almost 40 years of meeting at Goodview Road, Hillendale Bible Chapel outgrew their little building and held meetings at Pine Grove Middle School starting in 1995. In July of 2002, the building we are in today became the Sunday morning home of Forge Road Bible Chapel. Now, I have grown up in this church body my whole life. I was born in 2000, so my first year and a half of church attendance were at the school. So I don't remember it very well. <laughs> my parents told me about a makeshift nursery that would be put up every Sunday at the school. But even after they described that in great detail and reminded me, I still didn't remember it very well. Last year, when Andy Dunkerton spoke, marked the first time I had ever remembered hearing the name Alfred Loazzo or of his contributions to the Lord's work that I have grown up in and lived as, an, as a direct beneficiary of. I began to think that when he started Hillendale Sunday School for Children, that I was one of the children he was thinking of, even though we were born generations apart. Spurred on to Inquisition, I floated the idea of a documentary-style movie encapsulating the history of the Lord's work at the chapel and of the people who attended. I casually pitched this idea to the College and Career Bible Study Group, and rumors of this movie, as rumors so often do, spread like wildfire through interested parties. Soon, word found its way to Tom, who approached me this January asking if I would like to speak with him on the topic of spiritual heritage, an invitation I carefully considered for about five seconds before gladly accepting. Fourth of July weekend seemed like a good time for that subject. It is that most American holiday filled with parades parties, pyrotechnic pandemonium, and picnics where we fire up the grill with as much meat as is usually a portion to feed a family of 10 for a week. As comedian Jim Gaffigan said, I don't usually eat a burger, a brat, and a steak, but it is the 4th of July. It's what the founding fathers would have wanted. 4th of July is a national celebration of our heritage of independence. So what is heritage? 
The definition of heritage by Merriam-Webster is something transmitted by or acquired from a predecessor. Often, we inherit things from passing family members. They can be as significant as hundreds of acres of land or as humble as $100. They can be decorative, like a picture, or practical, like an old watch. But what they are physically is not what altogether makes them valuable. A well-worn watch handed down from father to son will hold more value in the eyes of the son than it will to a random passerby who sees it as merely a watch. The son sees the watch not only for its utility of timekeeping, but as a reminder of who owned it before him. If the watch is owned by a third party, the wearer gains only knowledge of the time and maybe a reminder of those bothersome scratches and imperfections inherent in an earthly possession with a prior owner. There is no existing relationship that makes the possession as valuable as it would to whom the full context of the watch is known. But as valuable as heritage is, it can be lost, it can be undervalued, disregarded, and forgotten. For Israel, there was nothing more important to their heritage than the book of the law. It was of great utilitarian value. It was their guidebook for life. But it was more than that. It was their connection to the struggles and triumphs of their past, to Moses, Joshua, David, and to their own tribes and families recorded in those books of generations that they so carefully kept. But it was still more. It was their connection to God, timeless, unchanging, the same throughout time, the same God who had opened the Red Sea and gave them manna through the wilderness. And somehow, this book, the very essence of their heritage, they lost it. They valued it so little, consulted it in so infrequently, believed it so little that they actually lost it. The irony of this account should not be lost on us. Josiah was 26 years old when they found the book of the law. He had never read it, and never heard it read. When he finally heard it for the first time, he tore his clothes because neither he nor his kingdom were doing any of the things God wanted. It got me thinking, I'm 19 years old. Suppose for a minute that Forge Road lost all contact with the Bible. And although I grew up in Sunday school, starting at that makeshift nursery at Pine Grove, I had never heard it or read it. There were no Bibles in the rack. There were no Bibles in the cabinets. No one brings a Bible to church, and for years and years, it is not even mentioned. And one day, perhaps there's a work day, and somebody cleaning out an old closet finds a dusty old book. Light bulbs of recollection start to go on, dimly at first, and then some memories in the older of us. We come together to listen to it, to read, to recover, and rediscover the commands of the Lord. I suppose we would all feel both an excitement and a shame. Shame for having lost this, our spiritual heritage, and an excitement for having found it again. Today, I can be very thankful that a knowledge of God's word was established in my home. But we cannot be so arrogant as to believe that it cannot happen to us. We should strive to be Christians who actively foster an ever stronger and closer relationship with our Heavenly Father. The Lord of all creation wants a relationship with us, you and me, and has given us the tools, the Holy Spirit and Scripture among them, to kindle that most rewarding and fulfilling relationship. Earthly possessions, physical manifestations of heritage that we receive, despite their momentary purported indispensability, will eventually become derelict and dilapidated, long lost and soon forgotten. But we can hold fast to what does not become lost or forgotten. A relationship with our Lord, God, and Creator is what we should pursue. The mode by which this relationship is fostered is sitting before me, sitting before you. The Word of God, as it has been translated, preserved, protected, cherished, memorized, and distributed for thousands of years is one of the greatest gifts of all. 
Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Stuff we inherit from our parents withers and fades, but not this spiritual heritage. Isaiah chapter 40 says as much. All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Another excerpt from Isaiah, this time in chapter 51, urges our focus to the greatest gift, salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is freely ours should we choose to accept it. Isaiah 51 verse 6 says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look to the earth beneath. For the heavens vanished like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. So this morning, with the words of the song, that it is my heart's desire to know him more, to be found in him and known as his. There is no greater thing. In second, in First Kings 21, we read an account from the days of the divided kingdom when Ahab was king of Israel. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it is near next to my house. And for it, I will give you a vineyard better than it. For if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth and money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. In past weeks, we have been reminded more than once that the Bible rewards attention to careful detail. That, that not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away until all is fulfilled, and that we should read and listen to the scriptures in the words of one of our recent devotionals to ev with a singular focus, paying attention to every single word. The single word from the English translation that I want to draw your attention to this morning is the word of. Naboth said that he would not give to Ahab the inheritance of my fathers. Now we think of inheritance as being from our fathers and mothers, but Naboth did not say the inheritance from my fathers, but the inheritance of my fathers. When God brought Israel out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, there was a destination. They were going somewhere. They were going to the land that he had sworn unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And again and again, the Lord called this land their inheritance. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, To these the land shall be divided as an inheritance according to the number of names. Each shall be given its inheritance the land shall be divided by lot. They shall inherit according to the names of the tribes of their fathers. You shall divide the land by lot as an inheritance among your families. There, everyone's inheritance shall be what, whatever falls to him by lot. An inheritance is not something that you work for or earn. It comes to you because of who you are, not because of what you do. Israel came across the Jordan and into the land, and the Lord went before them, and they moved into that land uh, that was ready-made for them, with cities that they had not built, and wells they had not dug, and vineyards that they had not planted, like a home that you might inherit from your parents that you hadn't built or paid for, but you move in, and it's yours. The time came when the land was to be divided up. Now, uh, here in America, we would divide up land 
like this. This is the Oklahoma land rush, April 22, 1899. Every man for himself. You could stake a claim for 160 acres if you got there first. But the tribes of Israel were not going to rush to lay hold of their land. They're not going to fight over it in battle or in court. But instead, it was going to be carefully surveyed and then divided by drawing lots, like a, like a lottery, first among the tribes and then further among the families. The lottery happened in Shiloh, and the survey takes up almost the whole second half of the book of Joshua. From chapter 13 to chapter 21 is just surveys and lines and boundaries and markers, and Joel Leiniger thinks this is the most exciting story in the Old Testament. Dividing by lot does not mean that it's going to be random. It doesn't mean that it's just going to be luck. We've heard in our messages from Esther that the drawing of lots and the throwing of dice can be of the Lord, and so it was here. They understood that the Lord was behind what seemed to be chance or randomness. They understood that the, Lord, that the land would be divided to each family as its inheritance, and so its heritage in the Lord. The words from that survey and that lottery are in our language today. We still call the ground that your house sits on a lot. Now, it's not hard to draw the spiritual principles from this picture. For the Lord has divided out to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We heard last week from our brother Mark Francis, who spoke to us from 2 Peter about pressing on to spiritual maturity. Mark said, well, that God has given to every believer everything that he or she needs to live a life that pleases him, all things that pertain to life and godliness. This is from Psalm 16. O Lord, you are the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You maintain my lot. The survey lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. David is talking about his heritage in the Lord, the days and the contours of his life, his opportunities and his trials having been distributed to him by the Lord, the same way that the land of Canaan was divided in the days of Joshua. He could look back through life and see how the Lord was protecting him and preserving him. And he says, Lord, you are my inheritance. Or as we heard a moment ago, there is no better thing. The land distributed by the Lord to a family was its heritage, its participation in his blessings and in his provisions. And as a family worked the land, as they were, they were sowing and reaping as from the Lord, the produce of the land was his provision. It was the direct and daily connection of each one to the Lord, seeing his mercies new every morning, treating the land with respect and care, bringing the best of your knowledge and the best of your efforts to invest in what the Lord had given you. And then the land, for the land would bring forth, as Jesus said, to some 30-fold, some 60, some 100-fold. And then to pass on that land, to pass on that work to the next generation. That was Naboth's vineyard. And that was not for sale. King Ahab said that he could give Naboth some other ground that was just as good or even better. But Naboth didn't think so. It was his heritage, not just from his fathers, but the inheritance of his fathers binding the generations together. Naboth could trace that land back generation to generation all the way back to Shiloh where this land came out from the Lord to his family. Now everyone was not as faithful as Naboth. Over the years and over the centuries land could and would be bought, sold, subdivided, mismanaged, even lost. But in the law of Moses, there is something called the year of Jubilee. And it happened every 50 years. 
Sometimes we study the law of Moses and we talk about the history and that's helpful and we talk about types and they are enlightening. But in all of our studiousness, we should not miss what the law says about the heart of our God, the magnitude of the grace that he bestows upon us and that we should therefore bestow upon one another. Every 50 years, debts were forgiven, slaves were freed, and all the land went back to the way the Lord had originally distributed it out, restoring to each family its inheritance and to each one his possession. That's why you were forbidden to move an, an ancient landmark, because all the surveyors were going to need those marks again in the Jubilee. Just consider the audacity of this, the magnitude of this. It's hard to grasp because we have nothing to compare it with in our society today. You want to talk about wealth inequality in America today? Imagine if we did this. Every 50 years, all the wealth gets redistributed back the way the Lord divided it out, and we are all equal. It would only happen once or maybe twice in your life, but it would be a day that you would never forget. It would be on the seventh month and the tenth day. Now, we're in July, which is the seventh month of our year. Today's the fifth day. So what if the Jubilee was next Friday? Every news channel, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, everybody, they got a clock in the bottom corner of the screen, and it's counting down to the Jubilee. People are scheduling Jubilee parties, and stores are running Jubilee sales, and there's a huge ball affixed the top of Times Square ready to drop. And when the day comes, and when that ball starts to move, you feel the weight of debt and the weight of inequality slipping off your back. You feel the anticipation of a new world and a new start. And it's right there. Your mortgage debt is gone. Your car payment is gone. Your credit card bills are gone. Your student debt, it's all gone. All the mistakes of the past 50 years, any bad decisions, any moments you might regret, maybe some last year, maybe some last week, it's all gone. And your inheritance is restored to you in full by the grace of the Lord. And you don't have to live in debt, not to debt, not debt to God or one another. And you don't have to live in grief. And you don't have to live regretting the past because all of that is gone. And before the Lord, we are all equal. That's what the kingdom of God on earth is going to be like, and that is what Jesus Christ came to do. Two weeks ago, we saw from Luke chapter 4, this was the slide we had up two weeks ago, of how Jesus came into the synagogue in Nazareth and stood up to read, and he looked for a particular place, and the place that he looked for was the Jubilee. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said. For he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That year is to declare the Jubilee. Let's put this together. The scriptures describe our salvation as an inheritance. Those who inherit salvation. We do not work for it. We do not earn it. We are not owed it. We possess by faith what we could not earn. We inherit salvation. We get it not because we are really good and pious people, but because we are born again children of God. And Jesus Christ came to secure that inheritance of salvation to us so that it could never be taken away. And Jesus Christ came so that every sin Every mistake would be washed away in the flood tide of his grace, and that today we would see life anew. We would see life aright. And if we look hard enough, we can see the dawning of a new age. And so see in every day the experience of the new mercies of God 
and new opportunities as we explore the wealth of his blessings. So was that vineyard to Naboth. We heard a few minutes ago about what the law, book of the law meant to Israel. Nate said that the book of the law had great utilitarian value. It did. It was their guidepost to life, guide, guidebook to life, but it was more. It was their link to past generations of the people who had written it and preserved it, but it was more. It was their link back to the Lord, for it taught us his ways and showed us his heart. Each of those things that was true about the book of the law, they were true about that vineyard for Naboth. It had utilitarian value. Vineyards produce grapes that both feed and cheer a nation. But it was more than that. It was his heritage, his link to the generations before him. And so today we've heard of spiritual generations, of men and women making provision for the spiritual generations coming after them. But it was even more than that. It was his link to the Lord. And in the Lord, a whole new way to live on higher ground without burden or guilt or worry, without division between people and true equality among us. And those are not just nice words. Now the world, the King Ahab's out there, they don't get this at all. You can't live like that. Just forgive past wrongs. That would be ridiculous. That would be impossible. That's bad economic policy. They think your faith is quaint. It's nice. It's sort of like a, a vegetable garden. You know, it would be a nice addition to my house, an interesting exhibit in a museum. So Ahab comes and suggests that he can give Naboth some other vineyard that's just as good, maybe even better. See, the world will offer you all sorts of stuff in exchange for your faith that it thinks is just as good, that it thinks is better. But Naboth wasn't selling, especially to an ungodly man. And neither am I, and I trust, neither are you. Finally, as today is the 4th of July weekend, I want to say a word about our inheritance of liberty as Americans. I love being a Christian. There is no greater thing. And I love being an American. This also is my heritage. President Ronald Reagan said that freedom is a fragile thing. It is never more than one generation away from extinction. If you haven't heard, this is a presidential election year. It is also a special anniversary year. 2020 is the 150th anniversary of the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which secured to men of color, including former slaves, the right to vote. It is also the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which secured to women the right to vote. To me, and I'm sure to you too, the right to vote is sacred. When I go to a polling place and stand in that line and take my ballot, I do that with a sense of reverence. My vote is not just an expression of a political philosophy. This is the inheritance of my fathers. I've already heard the mantra that is used every four years that this will be the most important presidential election in the history of America. And I know that there are those who will strongly support President Trump and those who will strongly choose Vice President Biden or some third party candidate. But respectfully to both sides, this will not be the most important election in the history of America. There are looking back, some elections that take on particular historical significance, the election of 1800, the election of 1912, the election of 1932, the election of 1980. But the most important election in the history of America, uh, in America occurred in 1864. The election of 1864 would decide the Civil War. 
the election of 1864 would decide whether we would be one nation or whether we would balkanize into smaller competing countries. And just as Abraham Lincoln was fighting a war to hold together North and South, he was also building the Transcontinental Railroad to link together East and West. The election of 1864 would decide the question of slavery or freedom, and whether slavery would be extinguished or whether it would continue and expand to the Southwest where there was nothing to stop it, nothing to slow it down from engulfing vast new territories. The fate of the war, the direction of our nation, the question of human freedom. And as events of the 20th century would turn out, much of the fate of the world would turn on the election of 1864. It would decide whether we would receive and realize the inheritance of our founding fathers. And the most important event of that most important of all elections happened here in Baltimore, Maryland. The election of 1864 was held in the crucible of a monstrous war that was in its fourth year, testing whether the nation or any nation conceived in and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal could long endure. The nation was exhausted. The Army of the Potomac and the Army of Northern Virginia were locked in an almost daily battle since Ulysses Grant had started his overland campaign. It is hard to understand today, but at the time, Abraham Lincoln was very unpopular. The Republican convention was scheduled to begin on June 7, 1864. Four days before it opened, on June 3rd, the Battle of Cold Harbor was fought, which was a Confederate victory and a Union disaster. Confederate armies under Jubal Early were pushing towards the outskirts of Washington, D.C., cutting off the city and sending panic through the government. Lincoln himself was most pessimistic about his chances of reelection, writing in August that, quote, this morning, as for some days past, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. The Republican Party which had existed for less than 10 years, was about to blow itself into various factions. People believed that there was no way Lincoln could win. There was no way Lincoln could even be nominated. And so they searched about for other candidates. That Republican convention was held in Baltimore, Maryland. It was to decide whether to nominate Lincoln for a second term. Many cons historians consider it the most important political convention ever held in the United States, maybe the most important political gathering since the Constitutional Convention. But the delegates to that convention rose to the occasion. They believed in national unity. And they believed this to such a degree that they temporarily renamed their party the National Union Party. They also believed in freedom and the end of slavery. And they believed this enough to introduce a resolution that denounced slavery as always and everywhere, hostile to the principles of Republican government, and that justice and national safety demand its utter and complete extirpation from the soil of the Republic. The New York Times, reporting on the convention, said that the reading of the resolution elicited the wildest of outbursts, especially the emancipation and anti-slavery sentiments enunciated. Congressman Jim Lane of Kansas gave a great speech that failing to nominate would sunder the Union, make permanent the Confederacy, reshackle the slaves, dishonor the dead, and disgrace the living. Lincoln was nominated. The Union armies fought with newfound determination. Lincoln won re-election in a landslide, and we became the United States of America perhaps for the first time. That most important convention occurred at Front Street Theater in Baltimore, the place where that old factory now stands. The New York Times took out entire paragraphs to describe its 
lavish decorations, and grandiose appearance. The building is tastefully decorated and fitted up for the occasion. The galleries are festooned with flags and the interior stage is thrown open. There is numerous staff of pages in attendance who are decorated with tricolored badges. Today, to the unknowing eye, it is nothing more than a derelict and dilapidated eyesore. Tom and I went down there on Friday just to walk around. There is no plaque commemorating those most important proceedings that happened there 156 years ago. There were no tour guides excited to tell you all they knew about the place. There was nothing there to suggest that anything important ever happened there, that Abraham Lincoln was nominated for the presidency right there, that the fate of the Union was this debated and decided right there, right there, it was decided that the nation, so conceived and so dedicated, would endure. Most people just walk by and have no idea. It makes me think how important it is that we be always renewed in what we have inherited as Christians, and that never losing touch with that which does not fade or become old, the word of God. A couple of weeks ago, Tom pointed out that Jesus, a poor a poor son of a carpenter from Nazareth, living in a society with a measly literacy rate of 3%, could read. We know from Luke chapter 2 that not only could he read, but he was so well versed in the scriptures that at the age of 12, he could discuss them as well as any expert of the day to the expert's utmost amazement. Jesus didn't sell short the time he had on this earth to learn of his father. And being at that old factory also makes me wonder what other places there are that look so ordinary, but where great things have happened, things that God thinks are great. Like a schoolyard where someone from Child Evangelism Fellowship taught the gospel and a child was saved, or a Sunday school classroom, or a small lot in the Hillendale neighborhood, or even a makeshift nursery set up in a middle school. But if you know what happened there, then you linger and look and reflect. And you know yourself to be better and a better citizen of heaven for having been there and having known. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Thank you for listening to us today. Tom will now pray to close the meeting. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you saw us in our need and you came and you, and you sent your son that he, would, uh, that he would bring us such great blessings, that he would give us an inheritance among the saints in the light, that he would assure to us the blessings of your love. Our Father, we pray that we would be daily renewed in these things, that we would live uh, looking for his coming and his kingdom, and in everything that we do, uh, showing forth the, the, the new life that is within us. Father, on this weekend, we pray for our nation. We pray for the president, for wisdom and strength to him for the leadership and the members of our Congress, for our Governor Hogan, for the government of our city and the new government that is coming in. Father, we pray for unity in our nation, nothing that is uh, just a facade of unity, but a, but, a renew, but, but a renewal unto the best of the principles on which we were established. 
We pray, Father, for this uh, difficult time of the pandemic. We pray giving thanks for our first responders. We thank you for them. We pray your protection upon them. We thank you for those of law enforcement and the peace officers, how they serve as first responders as well, and for those who are among us. Lord, that you would give them safety, protection, and security, and wisdom and discretion in their work. We pray for our body of Christians here, that we would day by day, day by day, be renewed in, in, in the joy of your salvation, and that we would be renewed in dedication to bear the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this morning. We give you thanks in his name. Amen. Our meeting is dismissed, and like Nate, thank you for listening to us today.